Okay. Um, good evening, everybody, um, and it's nice to see you again. Um, uh, today we'll uh, try and uh, go through some of the basic uh, practical aspects of uh, transesophageal echocardiography. Um, I will aim to mainly look at the various views that we use uh, in TEE uh, to look at the various cardiac structures. Uh, and I will focus on just no normality. So I'm not going to do any pathology as such, uh, but we will just look at the various views and the angles that you can use, et cetera. Uh, initially, we'll familiarize ourselves with the uh, uh, various settings of the TE and how to manipulate the probe. Uh, so this is actually uh, targeting you know, people who are just starting to uh, TE um, to make them familiar with uh, the process and uh, the you know the basic views to view the heart. Um, so now, first thing we need to know uh, is what are the indications and contraindications of uh, TE. So TE is mainly used as an adjunct to transthoracic echocardiography. So particularly in pediatric cardiology, uh, we get quite good imaging on transthoracic um, echocardiography. So our need for TEE is very limited. Uh, there are certain situations, though, where TEE has a value, OK? And one of them is in assessing valve morphology. So especially mitral valve or tricuspid valve morphology, uh, you know, especially if you're thinking of repairing the valve, uh, then uh, it's very useful to uh, have additional TEE information. Often, most of us do a transthoracic, and then subsequently, once uh, treatment has been planned, for example, surgery, uh, we do a, a on-the-table preoperative TE to guide the surgeon. Again, TE can be useful postoperatively as well uh, to assess, you know, how good the repair has been carried out. Um, so that is one uh, utility of the TE. Uh, TE in, uh, in our patients. Now, um, particularly in adult patients, uh, it becomes essential uh, in certain situations. For example, to rule out a left atrial appendage clot before cardioverting a patient in inpatient, uh, or in infective endocarditis, especially in an adult, particularly when there's a prosthetic valve, uh, it is difficult to rule out vegetations without transesophageal echocardiography. In children, uh, in uh, infective endocarditis situations, often uh, transthoracic echocardiography is adequate. Uh, but in adults, um, I think uh, TE is very essential to rule out vegetations and uh, infective endocarditis. And of course, to aid in cardiac intervention. Uh, now, as uh, intervention becomes more and more advanced and uh, aggressive, uh, TE is a, an invaluable tool uh, in cardiac intervention. Now, I am a person who strongly believes in TE, uh, and uh, you know, I, for ASB closures, um, I think it it helps to size your devices accurately, and it prevents oversizing of devices. Similarly, for VSD devices as well. Uh, I think it gives you a very good appreciation of how close you are to the aortic valve uh, and gives you that extra level of confidence uh, before you release the device. So um, I think TE has a huge role uh, in cardiac uh, intervention. Now, where is it contraindicated? Uh, this is primarily in uh, older patients, really. Uh, in our children, it is hardly ever contraindicated. Uh, of course, the important thing is to uh, use caution while inserting the TE probe and use the appropriate probe for the appropriate patient. But in the older population, uh, esophageal pathology like strictures or tumors, varices, these are all contraindications. Or previous esophageal surgery, if recent, uh, might be a contraindication. Again, a very high INR uh, is a contraindication, and I think in that setting you would want to correct the INR perhaps before doing the TE. Of course, any situation you have to, uh, you know, evaluate the risk and the benefit. You know, how much additive value are you getting from the TE before you make your call as to whether you should go ahead or not. Okay. Now we talked about the appropriate TE probe for the patient. Now, uh, as you know. There are several sizes of TE probes. You have the adult TE probe, 
then you have the pediatric TE probe and you have the neonatal or infant TE probe. Now, uh, the last one that I mentioned is not widely available uh, and it's quite expensive. So, not many units have that neonatal TE probe or the really small TE probe. So, often most of us work with the adult TE probe and the pediatric TE probe. Now, the adult TE probe, ideally, if the recommendation is that you use it in patients who are more than 30, 35 kilograms. In practice, however, we do stretch these boundaries quite a bit. Uh, and, you know, we use, you use the adult TE probe in uh, children who are 20, 25 kilograms uh, and sometimes even lower. Uh, the pediatric TE probe, uh, is you is not meant to be you know I, in ideal circumstances not meant to be used in very small babies, but again uh, we do find that we are able to use it uh, as long as you don't have to use too much force and you're able to slide the probe down easily. I think you're okay. So you have to evaluate the appropriateness of the probe for the patient on a case by case basis. So, in terms of preparation, uh, what do you do? Now, in a child, uh, doing TE involves giving some form of general anesthetic. Uh, in a more grown-up patient, say a teenager who will cooperate with you or an adult patient, then uh, you might get away without using uh, an anesthetic agent uh, with just local anesthetic spray and maybe some sedation. So. Uh, in, in a child, it is often general anesthetic, either complete general anesthesia or at least intravenous anesthetic so that the patient, uh, you know, remains cooperative during the procedure. So you have to keep the patient nil by mouth, so that is important, uh, for anywhere between four and six hours. So that is one of the first prerequisites. Then in the adult patient, you need to have 1% lignocaine spray, which you can spray at the back of their, um, you know, pharynx so that they have adequate local anesthesia. Then you give IV sedation uh, in the form of midazolam perhaps to settle them if they are agitated. Now some patients can be extremely cooperative, some can be extremely agitated. Uh, so depending on your patient, uh, you have to decide whether you need to use IV sedation or not. Uh, sometimes you may need to use some medication to reduce the amount of secretions. It is important, like glycopyrrolate, it is important uh, to have a little vomit bowl next to you because sometimes these patients can vomit. Um, then um, positioning is, you know, is important. Uh, so often you may want to lie them on their side uh, to make it a little bit easier for you to uh, tee. So, and of course, uh, don't forget the mouth guard because the tee probe is extremely expensive. And the last thing you want is for your patient to bite down on the probe and damage the probe. So uh, particularly in an awake patient, a non-anesthetized patient, mouth guard is extremely important. Right. So this is your preparation. So next you go on to um, a couple of slides where I will try and correlate the various um, sort of levels of the uh, uh, chest or the thorax. Uh, with what you expect to see on T. Okay, so now if you consider the uh, chest or the thorax at T4 level, and this is the esophagus, uh, this is the trachea, this big thing here, okay. Uh, so at that level, uh, you mainly see the transverse arch, and the transverse arch is to the left of the patient, okay. So you don't really see much else, um, and in front of the esophagus is the trachea. When you go down a little bit more uh, to T6 level, uh, you, you have the left main bronchus in front of the esophagus. Therefore, you don't see the left pulmonary artery very well, okay? But what you can see is if you're in the esophagus and you turn your probe right round, say, turn it right round, rotate it right round 180 degrees, you will see the descending thoracic iota, okay? Now, um, anteriorly or looking forward, you will see the right pulmonary artery and you will see the ascending iota. So these are the things that you can see uh, by TE at the T6 level. Now as you move down a little bit to the T8 level, this is your uh, standard mid esophageal level, okay? And this is where you start seeing your four chamber view. 
and you can see uh, how the left atrium is so T friendly. It is the most posterior uh, part of the heart uh, and it is very easily visualized by TE. That is why the uh, TE is an excellent modality for imaging the mitral valve. So at that level, uh, you uh, see the LA quite well, the mitral valve, and you can get uh, a four chamber like view at the T8 level. Uh, and behind posteriorly is the descending iota. So this is just for you to get an appreciation of what you can expect to see at the various levels of uh, the thorax. Now in terms of uh, standard uh, T echo windows, now these are obtained at three um, standard levels. Of course, in each patient, this level will uh, vary, particularly in our pediatric population. It is very dependent on the size of the patient. So these uh, centimeter markings are actually for adults, whereas in children, it is very much a matter of trial and error. So we normally get TE views at three different levels, the upper esophageal level, the mid esophageal level, and the transgastric level. Normally what I tend to do is I go straight for the mid esophageal level. This is where you get your standard views like the fourth chamber view or your five chamber view. You can get a short axis view, your bicable view. All of these views can be obtained at this level, okay? Then once I have looked, examined the various structures at this level, I then go transgastric. So, you know, you basically transgastric involves advancing the uh, TE probe even further and deeper so that you are now looking upwards. You, you anti-flex the probe and you look upwards at the heart through the stomach. Uh, and then once this has been done, I then come up and finish with the upper esophageal level. So I normally go mid-esophageal, then transgastric, and then upper esophageal. Now, when you're doing a PE, uh, you're obviously doing it for a certain purpose. For example, it might be to look for infective endocarditis, uh, or it might be to assess um, an ASD. Uh, so whatever the purpose, there is a, a, a purpose or a goal for your TE. Now, especially in an awake patient, the period of time that the patient will cooperate with you may be variable, okay? So if you have a patient who you're not sure how much they are going to cooperate with you, then it may be wise to do a targeted scan, okay? Which means you first look at the bits that are important to you, why, you know, the reason for doing the TE, do that first. Once you have adequate information and you can still carry on the study, then you look at all the other uh, various structures. Uh, now, the pitfall with this method is that sometimes you can get so absorbed in that structure that you're looking at uh, and keep on looking at it that you forget the rest of the heart. Uh, so although in the ideal world, you want to actually do it in a systematic segmental fashion, uh, sometimes in, in the practical world where you have, a, you know, a slightly uncooperative or awake patient, you may have to do a targeted scan, get the most important information first before you proceed for getting more comprehensive or complete information because you already have transthoracic. So, you know, you're looking for additive information. You would look like quite a fool if you started very systematically and looked at unnecessary data and then ended up with the patient waking up uh, and then you not being able to get the important data uh, that you've actually gone in to look for, okay? So you have to play it by ear, you know, assess the patient and then make that call. So next we move on to probe manipulation, okay? So there are various terminologies that you have to get familiar with. Now, the two uh, simple uh, or the, the, the primary movements with the probe are one, pushing the probe down or pulling the probe up, okay? So that is called advancing the probe when you push the probe down and withdrawing the probe when you pull it up, okay? So these are uh, two of the manipulations. Then you can turn the probe clockwise or anti-clockwise, okay? So when you turn the probe clockwise, okay, that is actually when you rotate the probe, the handle of the probe uh, sort of towards yourself, 
the tip of the probe move, moves towards the right, right sided structures of the heart. Now when you go anti-clockwise, okay, which is away from yourself, so the, uh, you know, probe, which is the transducer of the probe, moves actually towards the left sided structures of the heart. So at any given uh, window, at any given level in the thorax, you have to, you know, rotate the probe clockwise and anti-clockwise in order to visualize the right-sided and the left-sided structures um, of the heart. So that is your second type of manipulation. Uh, then you can, uh, you have these buttons which can, uh, which go from zero degrees up to 180 degrees. Uh, and basically, uh, that allows the transducer to change its angle. So at zero degrees, uh, you have the left-sided structures of the heart on the left side of your screen, okay, and the right-sided structures on the right side of the screen. Uh, the uh, apex of the sector is at the top, uh, and that is uh, the posterior most part of the heart, and then the base of the sector or the, you know, the broad part of the sector is the anterior portion, okay. Uh, so that is at zero degrees. Now when you turn 90 degrees, 90 degrees, what happens is that the sector moves to a plane that is perpendicular to zero degrees. Now at 90 degrees, the uh, inferior structures are towards the, um, yeah, uh, Okay, the, su the superior structures are towards the, uh, the left of the screen and the inferior structures are towards the right of the screen, okay. So um, that is at 90 degrees and when you go to 180 degrees, the uh, left-sided and right-sided right structures are inverted. Uh, so the left-sided structures are to the right of the screen, sided structures are towards the left of the screen, okay. So uh, you just have to sort of work your head around it and understand that this is how the, uh, the transducer moves when you move from 0 to 180 degrees. Then you have anti-flexion and retroflexion. So you have two knobs, uh, one on top of the other often, uh, which allow you to, the bottom knob is usually the anti-flexion and retroflexion knob, and the one on top will be the right-sided lateral flexion, right and left-sided flexion knob. Uh, so this will basically allow the tip of the probe to move, to bend anteriorly, anti-flexion, and posteriorly, retroflexion. Then you have flexion to the right, and then you have flexion to the left. So there are some pictures here where you see that um, the probe, this, probe, this is actually the, the uh, transducer here. This is anti-flexed, this is retroflexed. This is flexed to the right, this is flexed to the left. So these are the various maneuvers. So it is important for you to, uh, despite you know what I might say, what you need to do is get the probe in your hand and you know play with all the knobs and look for yourself to see how the various uh, knobs work and how the you know how the rotation turns the tip of the probe. So it's important to go through that outside of the patient before you put the probe in and start manipulating the probe within the patient. Now, uh, now we'll go on to uh, sort of a diagrammatic or a schematic uh, view of the various, uh, you know, cuts of the transducer plane at the various levels of the heart uh, at different imaging uh, degrees, okay. So this is zero degree imaging, okay, and um, we'll see, sorry. <clears throat> So this is uh, where it says 2 is the mid-esophageal uh, four-chamber view, okay, or the zero-degree view, the mid-esophageal zero-degree view. And when the sector cuts through the heart in that plane, you can see that the apex of the sector will show you the atria and the base of the sector will show you the ventricles. And you can see that here in the form of a four-chamber sort of image. So that is at zero degrees at a mid-esophageal level. When you move the, advance the probe downwards, okay, and become more transgastric, this is basal transgastric, okay. At the basal transgastric level, what you do is you see the ventricles in cross section. So actually you see how you've moved away from the atria, you're cutting through the ventricles in short axis 
as you would in a short axis view, uh, transthoracic short axis view. This is again at zero degrees. Now, when you advance the probe even further and you go into deep transgastric, at this point you have to anti-flex the probe so that the probe transducer uh, head, you know, moves anteriorly and looks upwards through the stomach at the heart. Now, when you do that, you uh, the apex of the uh, sector will first see the ventricles, yeah, and then other structures, right, and then the atria. And in that view, you actually see uh, the ventricles like this, at the, at this would be the apex of the sector, you see the ventricles first, you open out the iota, aortic valve, and you see parts of the atria. Uh, this is a very good view to actually Doppler the iota. So uh, this is the deep transgastric uh, five chamber view. Okay. So then when you come up, you come up to the upper esophageal position, uh, you look, you see uh, various structures, depending on the level that you're at, you can get one of these uh, three views uh, where if you're fairly high up, you will see the uh, main pulmonary artery with the RPA, the LPA may not be very clearly visible because of the trachea, and you see the IOTA and the SVC. Now, if you're a little bit lower down, uh, you start to see the uh, left atrium with the upper, left upper and right upper pulmonary veins. And in order to see the left upper and right upper pulmonary veins, you have to do your rotation maneuver, where you know you rotate clockwise or anti-clockwise uh, to bring the probe towards the right or the left, respectively. You can also see the left atrial appendage along with with these veins. Then, if you go down even further, you uh, start seeing the right lower and left lower pulmonary veins, um, and you will see the root of the aortic valve with the sinuses and the coronary arteries. So just with zero degrees at the various positions, uh, mid-esophageal, transgastric, basal, and deep transgastric, and upper esophageal, you can interrogate these various structures of the heart. Next, we go on to the, uh, the more longitudinal planes. Um, so this would be sort of 90 degrees um, and, you know, greater. Um, so you, if you look at uh, 90 degrees in the mid esophageal level, okay, uh, which is about here, uh, you you get uh, a bicaval sort of view. This is slightly higher up, perhaps, than uh, you know where you got your four chamber view, but you get more or less around the same position. Uh, you get the bicaval view. You may, if you don't see the SVC, you may have to come come up and go down to see the SVC and the IVC. Uh, because they are obviously at different levels. So you may have to do a little bit of withdrawing and advancing, okay? But that is at 90 degrees, this bicaval view. Um, then if you uh, go down further, uh, you get this sort of long axis view of the LV uh, with the iota. So you see the LA, the LV, and the iota, and more anteriorly, you see a portion of the right ventricular outflow tract. Um, so that's your sort of uh, longitudinal view. Just a little bit lower down, uh, you'll get, this would be probably about 120 degrees, roughly around between 100, say, and 120 degrees. Uh, there is a huge variability, uh, but around that, you will get this longitudinal uh, opening up of the iota, and you will visualize a portion of the RVOT, okay? Um, and then if you go further down, uh, deeper, you get the transgastric long axis view. Uh, so once again, th these views are very variable and they vary from uh, patient to patient. So the American Society of Echocardiography brought out uh, uh, guidelines for TE and they recommended that 20 different views have to be done to look at the various structures of the heart. Um, I think this is obviously, uh, these, this has to be tailored, um, uh, but there are a few important views that we cannot miss. So obviously this is the mid-esophageal four-chamber view, which is anywhere between zero and say 30, 40 degrees um, at the mid-esophageal level. Then you have the mid-esophageal two-chamber view, which is at 90 degrees, the long axis view, which we saw just a while ago, which is around 120 degrees. And these three are important views at the mid-esophageal level. 
There is another view called the mitral commissural view, which is at about 60 degrees, useful for looking at the mitral valve. Then you have the transgastric views, where you have uh, the basal transgastric, uh, then you have the mid short axis transgastric, um, and then you have two cha the two chamber view, which is the 90 degree view of the transgastric. So there are several views, and I think really getting too caught up in the nomenclature can be a little, uh, you know, confusing for a, a beginner. Uh, but it is important to know that there are several views. And I will show you what views are, um, you know, appropriate for the various structures, what are the important views for the various structures. So let us start with the left side of the heart, okay. So the important structure on the left side that is um, particularly in adult patients you may want to look at is the left atrial appendage. Uh, so this left atrial appendage uh, has, can be seen uh, at an upper esophageal level. So you remember uh, if you look, if you remember back a few slides, uh, we had zero degrees at uh, sort of upper esophageal level where we could see the left atrium, we could see the left upper pulmonary veins, and we could see the left atrial appendage. So at that level, or that sort of level, we then have to rotate our probe towards the left of the heart, okay, uh, which is away from ourselves. Um, and then once we have seen the appendage, then we, ro we rotate through the various degrees. So 0 to 40 degrees, you can choose an angle between that, then 40 to 80 degrees, and then 80 to 120 degrees. So it's important to use various um, degrees so that you visualize the appendage from uh, different perspectives. And what you're looking for, obviously, with the appendage is clot, or you want absence of clot. Uh, so, so you see this is a different, this is 120 degrees, so it gives you a different perspective of the appendage and what you see in here are the pectinate muscles. So uh, then you can put color into it and make sure that there is a good flow in, in and out of the appendage and that there is no filling defect which can give you a clue of a clot. Now very close to the appendage obviously is the upper pulmonary vein. So uh, once again at sort of zero degrees with rotation towards the uh, uh, left upper pulmonary vein. Uh, and you can put color into it. Uh, you, obviously you may want to reduce the scale a little bit to visualize flows better. You can put a pulse wave across the left upper pulmonary vein to Doppler the pulmonary vein. Uh, and this is all at zero degrees. Now at the same zero degree, after seeing the left upper pulmonary vein, if you move your probe downwards, you expect to see the left lower pulmonary vein. Uh, and when you see the left upper and left lower together like this, the one that is more vertical is the upper pulmonary vein. Okay, so here you see that the one that is almost vertical is the left upper pulmonary vein. So that is how you make out that that is the upper pulmonary vein. Uh, also, from there you can rotate your angle a little bit to get a different view of the pulmonary veins. Uh, here you notice that it's almost like a trouser leg and this is at about 100 degrees um, and you, you see that the uh, left upper is now on the uh, left side of the screen and the left lower is on the right side of the screen. Okay, so uh, the left upper and lower pulmonary veins can be visualized uh, at by moving, advancing your probe uh, initially the left upper is close to the LA appendage, you see that first and then you advance your probe and then you can rotate the, you know, the transducer angle uh, through various angles to uh, get a different perspective. Now if you look at the right side veins, uh, what you do is you start with the four chamber view, then you rotate the probe towards the right, okay. So you rotate the probe towards the right of the heart. Uh, so that the atrial septum becomes almost horizontal. So you can see how the atrial septum is almost horizontal. And then you just, with a little bit of rotation, get uh, the right upper pulmonary vein uh, visualized, okay. So if these are all, um, you know, you learn these movements more and more you do, you know, these scans. Uh, but this is just a broad guideline. Uh, once again, similar technique, once you've seen the right upper, uh, if you move downwards or you advance the probe and perhaps use a slightly different angle, you once again see the right lower and right upper. And even here, the right upper is the more vertical vein. So that is how you know it is the upper pulmonary vein. 
Then another view that is useful is the bicable view. So bicable view, uh, once you've got the standard bicable view, then you rotate the probe uh, towards the left and you open up the right upper pulmonary vein. So these are the various views you can use for the right, up, right upper and lower pulmonary veins. So once you've finished the uh, sort of the LA, the appendage and uh, the pulmonary veins, you move down to the mitral valve. Obviously, like I said, the mitral valve was made uh, or, you know, sort of designed to be discovered by TE, okay, because it is quite posterior. Uh, it is very well imaged by transesophageal echo. Now, uh, just to uh, revise the structure of the mitral valve, it has got two leaflets. It's got a posterior leaflet and it has an anterior leaflet. The posterior leaflet has got three scallops, uh, P1, P2, and P3. So P3 is the more medial scallop and P1 is the lateral scallop. Then correspondingly, the anterior leaflet is divided into A1, A2, and A3. Okay. Uh, now you, I'll now go through the various views that will help you visualize different parts of the mitral valve. Okay. So these are the various views that can be used to look at the mitral valve. You have the standard four chamber view. The commissural view, which is usually at about 60 degrees, the two-chamber view, which is about 90 degrees, and of course the long axis view, which is around 120, 130 degrees. This is at the mid-esophageal level. Then you have the transgastric views, you have the short axis view, uh, then you have the two-chamber view, which is at 90 degrees, and the long axis view. So we look at some uh, images and try and correlate them with a the schematic uh, in order to understand better. So if you look at this um, sort of diagram, uh, this is the position of the uh, mitral valve. Um, and I, we've just tried to have the various angles of the uh, T transducer so that we understand how we see different parts of the mitral valve. So at zero degrees, which is your uh, four chamber view, okay, um, we cut through A2 and P2, okay. So uh, these are the two leaflets that we, uh, or the scallops or portions of the mitral valve that we actually see on the four chamber view. Now, uh, when we move the, the angle a bit further, okay, um, we cut through different portion of the uh, mitral valve, okay. So uh, here we have A2, A1, P1, okay. Then moving even further to the commissural view, which is 60 degrees, we cut through P3 first, okay, then A2, and then P1. Uh, so similarly, and then when we go to the long axis view, we cut through P2 first, and then A2. So if you remember this sort of schematic, uh, it helps you correlate it when you actually do the various views and try and understand which part of the mitral valve may be uh, pathological. So once again, you have the four chamber view. Uh, sorry, actually that should have been on the other side. Uh, but this is A2. So like I, I said before, um, on the four chamber view, uh, you have, you cut through A2 and P2, right? Four chamber view, you cut through A2, P2. So this is A2 and this is P2. Now on the two chamber view, Okay, which is, sorry, 90 degrees. Okay, you expect to cut through P3, A2, and P1. So this is P3, okay, this is A2, this is P1. So when you correlate it with the schematic, it becomes a lot more easier to understand. And in your long axis view, you have P2 and A2. Similar to here, long axis view, P2 and then A2, okay? So now we'll look at some echo images. So this is your four chamber view, zero degrees. This is the LALV. This is A2, this is P2. Now if you move the angle a little bit more, so a little bit further up, okay? You cut through A3 here, A2 and P1, okay? So you can see A3, A2, P1. So this is when you increase the angle, say, from 0 to maybe 40 degrees. The bicommissural view, which is around 60 degrees, you have P3, A2, P1. So it correlates P3, 
A2, B1. Then you have the two chamber view which is about 90 degrees, cuts through P3, and A2 and A1. And then long axis, you cut through P2 and A2. Okay, so you have P2 here and A2 which is close to the IOT valve. So uh, what I think you need to do is sort of familiarize yourself with some uh, this diagrammatic representation of the mitral valve uh, and understand how each of these views cuts through a certain portion of the mitral valve. And these, this is a short axis uh, image and this is the posterior leaflet and this here is the anterior leaflet. The posterior leaflet occupies more of the circumference but is thinner. The anterior leaflet occupies less of the circumference but is broader. And uh, P3 is medial, P1 is lateral. So uh, this is how the various scallops are named on a short axis view. This is a transgastric short axis view. Um, assessment of the LV is not so important to us because uh, you know we don't really have too many wall motion problems. But this slide is just uh, to complete uh, rather than anything else. So various views of the um, you know standard views that we have discussed, the LV can be visualized. And each view gives you information on a certain wall of the ventricle, which you can then correlate with coronary artery territory. I'm not going to really delve very deeply into it because it's not really appropriate for us. Um, once again, you can uh, image the LV on a transgastric view. Uh, and it gives you a fairly good idea of, of the ventricular function. Uh, and you can look at the papillary muscles and subvalvar uh, region of the mitral valve. So after the LV, of course, you go on to the aortic valve. So this is your standard uh, sort of zero degree view. It is a five chamber view where from a four chamber, you have just pulled the probe up or withdrawn the probe uh, so that you have opened up the left ventricular outflow tract. So you, you can usually see two cusps of the aortic valve. The one that is adjoining the septum is always the right coronary cusp. And the one that is um, the other one which is superior to it could either be the non or the left. Now, you can identify whether it's the non or the left by uh, trying to see if there's a coronary artery coming off it. Now, visualization of the aortic valve, once again, uh, this is zero degrees like we've already discussed. The other uh, view that is very useful is the short axis view. How is this obtained? Same mid esophageal level, you go to 35 to 45 degrees. Okay, you get a short axis view of the heart where you have <coughs> the right atrium here, the tricuspid valve, right ventricle here. So these are the sort of this is the anterior ventricle, the left atrium at the back here, and right in the middle of the heart where you expect to find it, the aortic valve. Okay, and you can name the various uh, aortic cusps just like in trans thoracic echocardi echocardiography. So this is the non-facing cusp or the non-coronary cusp. And if you stand in the non-coronary cusp and put your hands out, you have the right coronary cusp on the right side and left coronary cusp on the left side. Okay, so uh, you have this, um, you know, uh, simple, fairly simple rule where you stand in the non-coronary cusp and you face the pulmonary artery and you put your hands out on the right is the right coronary cusp, on the left is the left coronary cusp. So once again, we are still sticking with the uh, aortic valve um, imaging. Uh, so this is more of a longitudinal uh, view here uh, where you're gradually opening up. So you're talking uh, anywhere between say 90 to 120 degrees. Uh, you're opening up the left ventricular outflow tra uh, tract in the long axis you see the septum and anteriorly you see the outflow uh, part of the right ventricle. This is a very good view for VSD closures. I'm sure many of you are aware um, and is very useful to avoid the aortic valve during VSD closure. And here as well, the cusp, there are two cusps and the cusp that is closest to the septum is the right, the superior cusp is the left of the norm. Okay, same here. So, the other thing you can visualize is the coronary artery. So at using the short axis view, which is about 40 degrees, this is the non-coronary cusp, this is the right, and this is the left. You can see how the coronary arteries are taking off from here. And you can put color on it at low scale once again. 
to look at it. Uh, this is more of a long axis view, and this again shows you. This is, uh, if you remember the long axis, we go back. This is the right cusp, and the superior cusp is the non or left. So again, this is the right cusp, superior cusp will be non or left. So from the right sinus arises a coronary artery, which is the right coronary artery. Then you can um, use the same long axis um, sort of view and you can withdraw the probe slightly and take measurements of the aortic root, aortic valve, the sinus of valve salva, the sinotubular junction and the ascending aorta. <clears throat> now um, you can, like I said, you can look at part of the ascending aorta some 20 degree or lo longitudinal uh, view and um, you, you can continue to look at the aorta with a little bit of rotation uh, as you pull upwards um, and you might have to rotate the probe slightly uh, towards the left as you, as you go upwards. Um, then as you know once you, um, you've seen the aorta in long axis if you go to zero degrees uh, you get a short axis of the ascending aorta. Uh, like we uh, saw uh, previously uh, where you see the right pulmonary artery, you don't see the left pulmonary artery very well because of the trachea, uh, but you see the SVC and the ascending iota in short axis. Uh, for the descending iota, what you need to do is say you are at zero degrees looking at a four chamber view, you have to rotate your probe completely, so turn it right round 180 degrees either way, one way or the other, okay then you see the descending iota in short axis. Once you've seen the descending iota in short axis, then you change the angle to 90 degrees. Then the probe sector becomes long axis. Then you see the descending iota in long axis. You can see here. So this is short axis or descending iota. This is long axis. Okay, so now we have sort of gone through the left side of the heart. We go to the right side of the heart. So right side of the heart, you start with the RA. Uh, so to look at the RA, four chamber view is very good. You can look at the four, use a four chamber view, hmm? uh, and you can see on the four chamber view the RA. You can also see the tricuspid valve and the RV. The other view that is useful is a bicaval type view where you see the venous drainage into the RA, which is important to know, uh, and you open up some of the right atrial appendage. But the important thing with the RA basically is to look at the uh, SVC and the IVC. Um, and really there's not much more that you want from the right atrium. Then you move on to the tricuspid valve. Now tricuspid valve at sort of 0 to 20 degrees, you can see two leaflets. Uh, one will be the septal leaflet, which is attached to the septum, and the other will be the anterosuperior leaflet. Now uh, you know the tricuspid valve has got three leaflets, septal, anterosuperior, and inferior. If you go uh, further out with your angulation, uh, maybe to more longitudinal or long axis sort of view, seven, uh, 75, 80 degrees, uh, you can see all three leaflets, septal and then anterosuperior and inferior. Um, and at about 100 degrees, you see the anterior and inferior leaflets. Uh, once again, this is useful when you're assessing a patient with Epstein's anomaly perhaps so that you can clearly see the various leaflets uh, and identify the abnormalities of various leaflets. Next we move on to the right ventricle. Uh, once again the four chamber view is useful to look at the right ventricle. You can um, see the size of the RV. Then you have the short axis type view. Uh, this view we have used before to look at the aortic valve. Uh, similar sort of view can be used to look at the RA, the tricuspid valve, the RV, RVOT and the pulmonary valve. And then you have the RV2 chamber view, uh, not very frequently used for patient sake. The views that I tend to use for right ventricle are mainly the four chamber view uh, and the short axis view, but you can use a, a, a two chamber type of view. This is similar to the view that we saw, you know, for the RA with the two, the SEC and the IVC coming in. And once uh, we have looked at the RV and the RVOT um, and the pulmonary valve, uh, we have to look at the branch pulmonary arteries and we know that this is done at a slightly upper esophageal level at zero degrees um, as you pull up uh, and you see the RPA much better than the LPA. 
So, you know, we have now gone through the various portions of the heart, uh, starting from the left-sided structures, uh, LA with the pulmonary veins, appendage, the mitral valve, uh, a bit of uh, LV, the aortic valve, and the iota. And then we've done the right-sided structures, which is the RA, the tricuspid with the uh, vena cavae, the uh, tricuspid valve, the RV, uh, and the pulmonary artery. Okay, so uh, this is how you do a complete sort of examination, uh, TE examination of the heart. Uh, obviously, I have not touched upon any pathology at all. Uh, I think you need to have a separate session where you can say, for example, you know, assess specific lesions on TE, for example, mitral valve pathology um, or specific, uh, you know, lesions uh, have to be assessed uh, and discussed. Uh, but this will hopefully give you a basic understanding of how to do TE, what are the ways. Uh, so I think in summary, uh, my uh, advice to you would be to start with uh, mid-esophageal level at zero degrees. Uh, get all the information you can from the zero degrees, uh, you know, various structures of the heart. Uh, you withdraw the probe at that zero degrees to also look at the aortic valve. Just gently withdraw to have a five-chamber type view as well. Uh, then you move down the degrees, then you move to about 35 to 45 degrees, which will give you a short axis type view. There you can see the iota, the RA, tricuspid valve, RV, pulmonary artery, all of these structures. Then you move the angulation further to about 90 degrees, which will give you a more longitudinal appreciation of the heart. You look at the bicable view, uh, you look at, you rotate the probe, and you look at the LV uh, and LVOT as well, uh, and then move the angle further to about 120 degrees, where you open up the LVOT in long axis. You start seeing the RVOT as well, uh, along with the pulmonary valve. You have to pull up a little bit to see the pulmonary valve. Um, and then once you've done all you can at that mid esophageal level, I would go down into transgastric views um, and start with a short axis type view or the zero degree view. Uh, and then uh, deep transgastric uh, view, which looks at the aortic valve uh, and change the angulation from 0 to 90 to get a more long axis view or a two chamber view. Um, and then finally, before finishing, uh, come up, look at the descending aorta at mid esophageal level by turning the probe completely around uh, in short axis and then 90 degrees for long axis. Then come up even further to upper esophageal level where you see the ascending iota and short axis, um, and you also see the branch pulmonary arteries. Uh, and then you finish off by looking at the transverse arch. Uh, so hopefully this will allow you to look at everything comprehensively. Uh, but like I said initially, important thing is you're going in for a particular piece of information, so you have to make sure that you get that piece of information. Okay? Uh, so that, I think that about concludes my talk. Now I would like very much uh, to strongly recommend that you visit this site. This is a fantastic site. Uh, please take down the web address. And basically, uh, it allows you to actually, uh, it's, a, it's a virtual TE program. Uh, so it allows you to manipulate the probe. You click on a button, uh, and it will take you from, you know, from four chamber to another view. Uh, it will show you what movements you need to make. You can work through this program and understand uh, basic TE uh, much better. So I would strongly recommend that you guys visit this website uh, and, you know, have a little play with the virtual teeth. It's good fun as well. So um, I strongly recommend that. Okay. So I think we're about done now. Um, and if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. Would you, do you want to ask me anything? You're welcome. Okay, I hope it was useful. Um, obviously, it's uh, just me talking. It's not particularly interactive. Uh, I think maybe if we do a session on pathology, then it can be more in a quiz sort of format. Uh, but I think because it was basic views and things, I could not, uh, you know, avoid being didactic. Uh, but I hope this was useful. All right. Then. Okay. Thank you.